Wonderful. It's going to take just a minute here. Okay, awesome. Going to double check that we are live. Perfect, everything is good to go. Okay. And we'll wait until 7.05 to get started. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording, if that's all right with you all. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's get started. Welcome, folks, on the live stream to episode 159 of Poets in Pajamas, featuring the wonderful work of Cindy Zhu Young Oak and Ojo Taiye. Um, we will get started with two readings, each 15 minutes long, and then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. Um, and uh, feel free to use the chat function to encourage the poets and ask any questions that you want, and I will transport them here for y'all. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our poets. Uh, starting up first, we have uh, Cindy Zhuyang Oak. Uh, who is currently a creative writing lecturer at Wellesley College, um, poetry editor at Guernica Magazine, and book reviewer at Poetry Foundation's Harriet. A McDowell, uh, McDowell Fellow, Ruth Lilly, Dorothy Sargent, Rosenberg finalist, 92Y Discovery Contest semifinalist, and Lambda Literary Fellow. Her poems are published in The Nation, Poetry, and The Yale Review. Cindy, whenever you're ready. Thanks so much. I am sharing some little gifts today. So I wanted to start off chatting about, oops, uh, the image. And I thought of this image, a collage by Yanira Collado, who I was introduced to, whose work I was introduced to by an artist, Amaz Wilson. This is an image of different uh, fabrics of colors and shapes and sizes that are all different rectangles put on a sort of deteriorating book page so that bits of text are coming through, but a lot of it is covered. And I think poetry can be this way as well. We have, you know, what's sort of put on the page and what it covers, what it hides, what it works with, the threads that it uses. Uh, and image has always been important, um, but it became especially important to me when I was finding books for the first time, as well as learning about book arts and, you know, thinking of books as not just bearers of words, not just bags of words, as uh, Ulysses Carion, the artist, uh, wrote about bookmaking. Um, this is a chapbook that I uh, had that was designed by Emma Wiberman in a very beautiful way where there was a little roof to make a little house of the physical book. And thinking about the physicality of the book was very interesting to me because I was very uh, concerned with my house and the unit of the house at the time that I wrote these poems. I was also teaching creative writing on Zoom. So I was thinking about work and that work next to the housework that suddenly seemed much more central to my life. And the first poem I want to read from it was about someone that I was thinking a lot about, which was our postman, Joel, who I sort of saw as this kind of connector between the house and the world. Uh, and it's called Provisions because he was bringing us all our provisions. The courier asked if I was back, but he knows I refuse to harvest. 
I only collect marred by yellow wages and groves and writing waves of mercy, heat, or radio. I tend, in fact, to catch fractions to avoid storms of light, my fault lines. The courier relies on moths to yell into windows and singe assorted change, chains, so I'm married to his manner of retrievals, reliefs. What I do is wait, mainly, leave candles writhing until I know this, to sow, punish, yes, to mass such that it looks as it is. And this slide is black text on, on white uh, background, as are all the text slides. Uh, when I went back to teaching in person, and I was, of course, you know, walking and going more places and seeing more things and people, I uh, wondered about scale, about kind of the proportion of images, the different ways that we can envision them and remember them and experience them. So this poem starts in a way that borrows from a poem called A Kind of Garden by Nika Giermini, which I think is in Bat City Review. Um, that one goes at the end, think of the wind is the first, is the first line. And mine starts with the title. At the end, think of the mushroom soaked and near dissolved, of the shrouded smile at the terminal or the fish whose stripes appear only on cooking through. Think through the thrown tantrums and basketballs, the berries unpicked in a heat wave or the yawn interrupting itself. Think on the photo unglossed at the crease, the orchid that at last the graveyard visits, the leavings of the resolute sticker and even the invited weight of an awning or a title. To think about any being, summon a kind of waste, about the glassy dress, shoes on the connecting flight, the veins memorized in illness, the temporary cover for the grand and sleepless windows. Fold each thought, word to word. The highway stop where toilet paper is piled, the knife marks on the counter with the ants carrying earwax, the wooden enclosure for a lake, flooded. The hum of the cobbled after party. Think. This image is a painting of a cover. Um, it's brown, kind of blinds open on this grassy view of three figures on a path. This is an image by Azadeh Tashpur, my friend who visited this library on the border of US and Canada. So this is a space that people can enter on both sides and a lot of families will reunite because they're allowed to uh, use that space. And it became especially important as a space during uh, the Muslim ban. And that's when she was there. She, um, she's from Iran and she went with a friend also from Iran to reunite with that friend's family. And something went wrong with the US patrolman and they the reunion was not possible that day. So this is an image of figures from the library uh, kind of at this distance, at this uh, separation. And um, it's, an image that I think thinks about the asymptotic, right? The closeness that is not truly close, that doesn't really feel relevant. And this was a project that was about how language acts on us and how syntax makes choices for us and guides and facilitates our thought, our interactions. Um, so I really appreciate using this piece. And um, Nat Plot is about the language of our dreams, or I guess the language of one dream that I had. The mass stabbing had long impended. We knew before they told us maybe something about body language. Their plans were taught, clean. We knew well we would be dead soon. Being contained was one thing, but the end of the breath would be notable, new. All this in the woods, cages enforced invisibly. Holding my hair up, I thought, if everything is inevitable, then nothing is. If I had this power to deny these facts of death, I had the power of God. I knew I would beg. I was a beggar. The man in charge, full of charm and rage, was adored by helpers, mostly women. In the dream, they were homely and I wasn't. Well, I wanted to live. Waiting, we looked down at our fingernails and shuffled in small concentric circles. I went to meet with him in a little office with some of us huddled on one side, them and their knives on the other. I was there to prevent unnecessary dying in general. But also, I told you, I wanted to live. In this hope, supposed myself an individual, the others a mass. Even my family, they were a part of the everyone I wanted to save, my sister appearing as a baby. As I had heard always in my mother's voice, they would throw our babies up and catch them on their swords, you know, likely a sort of elaboration. Still, I had to make the man laugh. 
I was to acknowledge his sense of self. It was helpful to list features that sounded specific but could apply widely. The game was not sexual or complicated. I held social sway and I hated it. All that was fixed. In the end, he gave me evacuation in addition to survival and he asked nothing. I saw he was suffering and I hoped he would not, though this was outside my locus of concern. I left, took a nap, still in the woods. Others filed back into the cities. When I woke, the grounds were a vacation space, adorned. Elderly couples played cards on wooden benches. The tide was low beneath a deck painted green. It was maybe an island now, in a bay. I walked barefoot on a dirt path where some from my original group circled around a red grocery cart. They stared at the pile in it at work on a new question. What do you do with the blades once the mass stabber has been appeased? We considered ocean, towels, taped boxes with handwritten warnings not to open. There was this idea that sharpness could not be unloaded, that in this last step, we might easily multiply harm. Briefly, we, contemplate, we contemplated burial. The conversation was not audible or visual, but transmitted among the various variants of myself, like in all my dreams. A negotiation of logic, finally, a proof. And shake out this next one, which is what we sometimes called earthquake drills in California, um, is plays with words and their kind of formation, I guess. Shake out. As a child, I went to extremes. Are you listening? Are you listening? The constructions we know of holiness and madness converged only later. Ambulances are cradled and dolls go to war for the same reason the word elegy appears so often in poems. There are places where shaking is expected, loss is assumed. You and everyone should applaud my labored nonchalance. Luckily, I happen to know that coyotes love cemeteries and vertigo onset is typical in such a clean gallery. This is the part of every night you honor the years you had person permanence. But of course, still water is only still internally and still moves when a tire is passed across it and back. Pagodas assimilate like peninsulas who have all gone agnostic, switching prison cells. When did the world turn color? As a child, you went to extremes. With our proudest discretion, we bleed what we idolize we cannot know, and then meet that wonder in each irritation. This next painting is not related to one of my projects, but is just a painting I saw in a, a museum and was very moved by. This is a blue swatch that from far away looks like a blue square, uh, but up close has very tiny rectangles of blue with some white space and specks of other colors in between that make up the piece. Uh, this artist, Young Il An, was uh, lost at sea um, on, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, outside I think of Los Angeles, for several hours uh, because of a fog issue, a weather issue, and then in one moment saw the light, and then and did this series called the Water Series about that sort of moment and about um, also the period of being lost, and it's very large in person, which I think is part of why it's such an immersive and exciting piece. Uh, but it also I think returns us to that idea of like these plots, these swatches of material like in Goyado's work, but approaching it in a very different way and, and the parts making up a whole, but the parts also not quite being available to be separate from the whole once we see them in this way. So the last poem I'm gonna read is from a series of poems I wrote about watching my elders dying in these awful uh, hospice wards in different places. So this one is set in Korea and it's called Home Ward. I'm going to read this last poem in two different ways. So this poem has small black uh, blocks of text separated into 10 sections uh, that are meant to look like beds. So it's like a blueprint. Um, from up above, and I'm going to read them across as well as down. Homeward. Patients laid along both long walls. Oops, sorry. Where was I to look? 
Patients laid along both long walls. There were nurses scattered, weaving through the patients, my Weharaboji's arms tied to each side of his small bed to prevent pulling of tubes out of his long arm, white gauze wrapped so taut he could not lift his hand. Walking down the small halls created by the elderly bodies, any bed might have been his. My eyes tossed well between skinny plots, my breath held to avoid their contents, slow molding. I had not had to search for that face, the smile that declares. His two detained liabilities were so thin to me, a stranger holding his hand. Their theory, our elders are less lonely in these rooms of sweat and whimpers. I dream of him for the first time, months later, silhouette body filled again, strong and smiling as we clutch. In months, he would be dead in every way, but I would not fly out because of my school schedule, the cost of travel. Across the northern border, his other descendants picture him at 30, father, frozen. Homeward. Where was I to look? Patients laid along both long walls. There were nurses scattered, weaving tubes out of his long arm, white gauze wrapped so taut he could not lift his hand. Walking down the skinny plots, my breath held to avoid their contents, slow molding. I had not had to search for his hand. Their theory, our elders are less lonely in these rooms of sweat and whimpers. I dream of in months he would be dead in every way, but I would not fly out because of my school schedule, the cost of travel. Across the Northern border, his other descendants picture him at 30, father, frozen through the patients. My Weharaboji's arms tied to each side of his small bed to prevent pulling of small halls created by the elderly bodies. Any bed might've been his. My eyes tossed well between that face, the smile that declares. His two detained liabilities were so thin to me, a stranger holding him for the first time. Months later, silhouette body filled again, strong and smiling as we clutch. Thanks so much. Cindy, thank you so much. It's so lovely. And I, and I love the PowerPoint as well. Those those slides are so helpful, especially with the accompanying visual components, which are always a treat. Um, we will move right along into our second reading of the night, uh, featuring the work of Ojo Taie, who is an eco-artist and writer who uses poetry as a handy tool to hide his frustration with society. Taie's most recent work is largely concerned with the effects of climate change, homelessness, migration, drought, and famine, as well as a range of transversal issues arising from racism, Black identity, and mental health. His current project explores neocolonialism, institutionalized violence, and ecological trauma in the oil-rich, polluted Niger Delta. His poems have been published or are forthcoming in Barrel House, The Spectacle, Hypocrite Reader, Narrative Magazine, Salamander, Consequence Forum, Stinging Fly, Rattle, Cincinnati Review, Banshee, Willow Springs, Lambda Literary, Fiddlehead, Puritan, Frontier Poetry, Notre Dame Review, or Strange Horizon. Taye worked on the Futures 2021 with Catalyst Arts and Belfast Photo Festival and 2021 Sustrans Black History Month Art Project, 2022 Swish Art Event. Taye, whenever you're ready. Everyone, thank you. I want to say a big thank you to Cindy and the poets and pajamas for the opportunity to share my points. Can you guys hear me clearly? Okay. Uh, the first one I'm reading is titled um, Climate Appetite. I live in a blanket of smoke. At times, my heart turns into bells. When I say we've lost that, I'm referring to the future. Home is falling apart. The, beautiful, the, blue, the blue beautiful world my brother left behind needs to help. When I say I'm self-flagellating, I mean my mouth, my teeth, my tongue. The scrubland is changing. How tricky this makes the world drought. And our lazy elders to gather all its argument for polite emissions. Listen, memory redeems and the past becomes a pentimento, like a sin, a kind of snapshot, a photograph in my head where my extended family are all smiling and they're not even the ones who survived the flood. The second poem I'm reading is, you know, I really don't know how to explain why I write poems, but I believe that a lot of research behind what's the poem right. So the poem I'll be 
I'll be reading next is titled Mama Coco. It's for my grandmother. It's sort of more like an exhortation. I was trying to extol her in this poem. How else to eat my own reflections? All along, my night swells with the melodies of our oldest laughter. We sing its blood, my avalanche. There is a tenderness that follows language. That winter, barely naked, she walks across the acre as gently as she could, breathless, holding cassava steps, her hands marked with belts. They stop the sharp edge tension of our label. She's in love with our occupation, a hayfield which reminds me of lineage and dexterity. I think of us living our whole life wearing a red dress, spun outside in. I can't remember a time there wasn't the constant plop, plop from the cassava puree tied in a white sack, fermenting against the kitchen wall, or the restlessness of squirrels gathering her corns at her backyard. My grandmother balances a rounded weight on a wooden stove, her voice us and gold, even when she breaks melon. Like braided cornrows, the harmonies come out in time measures. Her head raised high, staying attuned to the bleating sound of goats and sheep returning home to roost. As a child, I would wrap myself around her and fall asleep while watching the moon make magic of our tortoise tales, I mean, beautiful nativity stories full of kinship and wisdom. The relics of a good God whose name shining in Vaseline, wide and sweet, drips juice in my mouth like wonder. The third poem of reading is titled, Every the Tree Blues. For some years now, you lay out your blue coated pills and tang them for their and tang them for their test spots. The dilating seas that neatly occupy your bed with a living dream. The sky today is made of your the sky today is made of your lover's breath. You realize your love for him is like a city on fire, mother of all bum, and each growing desire is a wing shaped by time. You dream of homeland only in your poems. This is always what you wanted, to hold your breath when no one else would. All day you watch for the mail, lost in the reverie of some, lost in the reverie for some news from a distant place. You're an unhappy ten, a gray country, quietly waiting for the catastrophe of its own beauty. Haven't you traveled enough? The end, the chore, the be lost in the suspension of time. It may be the coldest month of the year, and you're an odd spot of calm, misled by warmth. How your imprecise side stayed up to watch the beginning of a new season. This morning, you woke up to snows and skies of laughter, not enough. The last one we're reading, second to the last, sorry, is titled, I worry I won't forgive, and I know why. For Odi Killings in 1999. Beloved, if I title this poem, Yenagwa's Black Market, will it bring back my mother's son? How long before we discover that the urgency behind all these massacre is oil rights? Today, I look at the burnt walls they left behind. Cruelty is crawled with clarity. We will kill all Ijo's. And I thought of all those ordinary women from Ogoni because at this moment, they are in one underground bunker and the bowel of the earth, organizing stiltedly. I'm in love with this kind of resistance, filled with awe. I gaze at the body of an old man, still clutching firmly to a copy of the Holy Bible, lying rotten in a pond behind the Anglican church. Sometimes, the man that will destroy your ancestral home wears a jackpot, and still, I hold a country to help me survive, even if I have to borrow forgetfulness. The last poem I'm reading is titled, 
it is time to go home. I think it shares the same semblance with Cindy's poem, Cindy's last poem. I'm afraid of the history I come from. And I'm afraid of my failing tongue. I misplaced the rivers I was beaten in. As a child, my dreams, the sky, my gratitude. I forgot about the cities, the favelas, the plains that reminded me of another home where I was a lone survivor. I was born backward with each syllable of my mother tongue mispronounced in hoylation. I'm 26 and I have no love experience. I didn't love my country, even though everyone tells me to be grateful. For whatever stays formless in other languages contains all the verb to make my body a bother. Milk, pulling my missing names into a yellow morning, where I claw for the two long bone scars chip down my mirrored face. Imagine I was given a wound I feel at the edge of my tongue. There are no rhyme between an ocean and a voice that translate as a single word for drowning and a song, lyric, for all the water in my mirror throat. I cannot sleep, I cannot rest. I'm drowning as those who could afford to live all over the world, oiled in the perfume of something burning. Home, a sleeve for silence, a river to cross. There will be nowhere to walk if the natural prayer of a swimmer is hope or hunger. I'm certain we are looking for vision in a world we have made with a dangling string. A hand bends and bends again, seaward. A distant sky. It is not my fault. I have found my ancestors at the bar, their ghost, at least. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Wow. Such incredible readings. Um, we will now move right into the Q&A section. Um, I have questions here. Um, and the first question that we always like to ask, uh, which is probably the easiest, um, but something to think about still, is what are both of y'all reading? Or what was the most recent thing that you read that you absolutely loved? Um, Cindy, if you would like to go first. I have been reading more novels and I have some more novels to read. Um, one book I found really interesting that I read recently was called Racial Melancholia, Racial Dissociation. And it was a sort of semi-academic analytic study of uh, Asian Americans in uh, Gen X versus Gen Y from, I think this uh, practicing therapist in college settings uh, and a professor. And yeah, I just found it very curious. There were a lot of facts in it that I found smart in it. Contextualize actually some of the poets from um, the older generation for me to understand like what college and high school might've been like at that time. As for me, I have not been reading books lately, but I think I've been buried in my own research, particularly because I am currently writing my debut poetry collection. So, and it has to do with, um, it has ties with climate change and fate and sort of perhaps eco-poetics and moral conviction. I've been trying to sort of more like dig about my history, particularly because the book has to do with the massacres and oil and the, the incidents or sort of more like the endemic oil culture in the Niger Delta. So that's exactly what I've been doing. I won't tell you definitely I've been reading a book, no. I've been doing some research, so hopefully that should come for something. <laughs> Exciting. Undoubtedly, yeah. Um, yeah, because I guess that's also hard too to like nail down exact. It's not like one book, it's so many books, or it's not one you know, article, it's it's so many articles to dig up all of the history of the Delta and and, and the, the massacres, yes. Um, incredible. Um, I will move us to um, the a, a more conversational aspect of uh, Q&A, where I wanted to ask both of you about a similar topic that 
um, I picked up on when I first read your work, um, and then certainly now again, um, which is the nature of confession and loss. Um, I both of y'all use, you know, personal pronouns I re relating to this personal experience that we have and 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 story that you the history that you pass along, and also there is loss uh, among many other things, but. Um, loss kind of weaving through parts of, of your poems. And I wondered if either of you had um, any thoughts or words to put to the idea of um, how your poems articulate loss and and what it, and, and how the poems work with it. Um, maybe exploring it or trying to solve it. Um, you don't have to have like, of course, an immediate answer off the top of your head. But I wondered if anything came to mind with the idea of the confessional nature, the personal nature of some of these poems and how your work deals with grief or loss or um, like Cindy, as you said in your in your last poem, kind of witnessing some of that uh, absence in later life um, or uh, Taye, some of the work talking about um, uh, that, certainly the, the Odi killings or the last poem, which was absolutely stunning. But if either of y'all have anything to say. As uh, for me particularly, I didn't come into poetry consciously or sort of more like, I didn't go into the act consciously. I think I lost my mom very early in life. So, and at that time I wasn't a poet entirely. I didn't even know poetry existed. So, but I knew definitely I had a responsibility to sort of more like uh, memorialize our loss. So, no, I me memorialize our past experience, our past experience. In a sense, because while on the day, I think the months and days I lost my mind, I wasn't around. I was practically serving my country in another state. So when I came back, they told me my mom was sort of more like, sort of more like sickness and she died and I couldn't cry. You know, as a man, definitely you just have to hold up. And, but I knew definitely I had to sort of more like, um, freezer memory. So I started with loss particularly. And more importantly, I have to say that most times the eye you see in my poems are not me. I'm just sort of more like bearing witness to most of the experiences that have happened to me or perhaps that I borrowed entirely from people around me. More like I'm inspired by the environments where I live. And loss is is something common around here not because i want to build my identity around loss no not exactly like that but i felt i have this need as a writer as a poet to be a witness and consolidate as a form of solidarity to what people are experiencing in this part of the divide and i try to use poetry as a medium because i feel is something I can, is accessible to me. Not as if I can write essays, not as if I can write, I can write fiction particularly, I can write nonfiction, but I think poetry is my only accessible form that I think I can express myself without no limitations, no um, sort of hindrance around. That's exactly what I can say. I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but that's what I have in mind at the moment. I think that it's difficult to write about loss. And what I read in my students' work and in poems I love is the interest in writing within the loss, you know, like sort of through the prism of it and the way that language changes or the way that memories become pieces and, and things like that. And And poetry does seem like a good medium for that um I yeah I don't know I um with my grandparents and and my frustration with the way end-of-life care is handled as people live longer and longer and we don't have good systems in place okay. um you know like I had a grandmother who lived 
with my uncle and, and his kid, but it became unsustainable um, just financially and physically for them. And um, that was a loss, you know, before she died. And then it was also a loss when she was in the nursing home. Um, and then it was also a loss when she was locked in because of COVID, right? So there's so many losses along the way. Um, I do find that with time, sometimes you end up remembering more about the earlier experiences with them later. Um, I don't know if you have that, Taya, but I feel like when they die and you're grieving them, you're you're really thinking about those last three months, last year, whatever it was. Um, and we have all these meanings that we attach to like the last word, the last time you saw them. Um, and then with time, you're able to see them whole in a way, uh, which is which is really sweet. And then as for the confession question, I think that it's just such an interesting word to me because it's so associated with the criminal system, the carceral system, and then also with religion. So it's not something I associate with, uh, but it seems like an interesting trend like to be used for these U.S. poets in the 50s in this particular way. And then now the meanings change. And at some point it seemed feminized and maybe less so in certain academic contexts. Um, and I guess confession, the word to confess, to me, there's an implication that there's something that causes embarrassment or guilt, some kind of self-conscious emotion. And that's not really the experience I have when I get to writing a poem. If I if I do have that feeling, maybe it's, you know, a friend or it's a journal. Poetry, it's very abstract and more technical to me. So th there's not that feeling of um, of, sh of shame of, to write something about myself. Even if I, if I say I am I, um, I still don't feel that pressure. Yeah. Do you, do either of you feel that? Mm, not really. I don't think I feel guilty, uh, sort of more like a shame expressed in my views about maybe a particular subject, uh, whether it's be grief, memory, or longing. I just felt I, it's a sense of duty for me, particularly. I hold maybe society that responsibility to, I believe there are no single stories. So my opinion still comes. So the way I see life comes. When it comes to whether it's loss, remembrance, and memory, longing, grief. So I'm not really ashamed. I, I think I, what I say, I'm proud. So it's not something I should be ashamed of. I love, I love both, of, uh, both of those answers to that too. Uh, I've been thinking about it a lot recently uh, in in the way that I especially like Cindy how you talked about the different ways that the confession has been viewed in like the religious context or like in, you know, through the the fifties onward how it does become feminized or how it just like the term confessional poetry is just slapped onto let's say Sylvia Plath and then it's just kind of scraped to the side and. Um, in, 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 in it's, it's condemned to that in a way, as opposed to Taye, what you said about like having the pride of of being able to be authentic or honest or relate experience, um, I think is so much more valuable than that, like the the inherent or uh, that the shame that is put onto the word or to the nature of poetry that comes from um, personal experience or the, the, the experiences that you are breathing through, right? There are, you know, the histories that are going into these words, even if you didn't personally experience them. Um, so thank you both for those answers. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask was to Cindy, you, uh, with your visual component. Um, I just wanted to know uh, two things. One, when you see something, is it uh, like, the, so the pieces that you, you chose to share today, um, are those things that you see and are immediately inspired by in a kind of cross medium way um, where there is something about these works that are extremely evocative in a way that feels like inspirational to your poetry or something that you merely just want to share? Um, and is there anything that you tend to look for in the physical medium that you also see reflected in the written medium? Just if you could talk about uh, that that the 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 two side by side. 
I think that when the parts of a piece are clearly visible and separate, but make up a whole that feels so core to everything that each individual part is doing, there's a feeling that uh, in that in visuality that there's like this undeniability or something. And I think when that happens with a poem, it's great. It's, it's wonderful where the lines can't just be quoted out and separated from the poem or something like it, it's sort of inherent and, and it stays together in a different way. Um, these pieces all came to me in different times and in different ways. You know, Azadeh's I saw in person at a residency and called her later to do the cover. Uh, I saw one at a museum, others I was introduced to in different ways. So I, I think that it's always different, but when something feels moving to me in that way and is an image, I, I keep it with me. I think of it often and I'll use the images to teach, you know, in my, in poetry classes, I'll use them um, just kind of to think and to reflect. Um, and again, it's different seeing them in person and, and, you know, they can change form too over the course of a life. But I think that I feel lucky to be around visual artists and to understand the practices of my friends who have less uh, verbal practices and to spend time with them, to spend time in their studios, to understand how physical it can be, right? Like stapling these little, you know, slides that need to become this suit or you know these plaster and and the amount of time that we need to wait and chatting while we wait those elements I don't have as much with poems where it's just me and a pad and if it comes it comes and if it doesn't it doesn't so yeah it's it's gracious for people to let me into their practices in that way and then for me to to benefit and for my poetry I think to also benefit yeah, that's beautiful. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, oftentimes it can be easy to to be pulled into one or the other. You you but you pick a, a book off the shelf and you don't even really look at the cover and you just kind of go right in. But um, specifically the 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 water piece, I I, I loved looking at that. And I, I can't remember if Nat Plot was the poem after that or not, but. Um, just like the like getting into the feeling of that painting, even though of course it's it's a, a digital experience of the piece that we're having, but still having that kind of invocation come over and then to continue into the words. I think there's there's something so powerful to that, um, something kind of ineffable about sharing different experiences through different mediums. Um, yeah, and that image was one that when I saw it in person, I I went up really close to what I was very shocked and. Uh, you know, I had so many feelings and it was a long period that I was just standing there. And then only later I found out the name of the artist, the fact that, you know, he's from an area where I have family in, in Northern Korea, now North Korea. Um, he, you know, is a Los Angeles person, like all these connections to my family and to me that I couldn't have guessed, but there was something like it, I almost felt like, did I know, you know, like how did I sense something that I felt with this artist? Um, and that was cool too, to not know anything as I experienced it for the first time. Um, Taye, I had a, uh, a question for you uh, because of the line that you shared in, it is time to go home. It's it's the first line and it, it's, it's, it's stuck with me so immediately. Uh, I'm afraid of the history I come from, and I'm afraid of my failing tongue. Uh, and that word in there, history, um, with everything that you talk about with climate change and the experience uh, of the pollution of the Niger Delta and um, the violence that has been done, I wondered if you could just speak on that word, history, uh, as it relates to your work and um, anything that comes from it. I know that you said, earlier in kind of a rhizomatic way that you feel that there is no one story, right? It is, or no no single story, it's all connected. Um, but I didn't know if specifically with the word history, you had you had some something to say. You know, initially when I started this poem, I didn't even know what I was writing. Uh, sort of more like I was just sort of brainstorming and 
a poem wasn't even fully formed. I think I came back again and started doing some writing even there. I, I come from a marginalized community, more like a subset. They are not really pronounced in Nigeria particularly. And I didn't grow up within my tribal environment. I grew up far from my tribe. I grew up in the Northern Nigeria, where you did speak outside and the rest of that. And what I was by what I mean by history, particularly, I think I the history of things that happened during the civil war, you know, and couple the fact that the voices, dominant voices in Nigeria tend to subdue um, other marginalized communities whose voices don't count for most of the policies changes. And when I said I'm afraid of my failing tongue. I am ashamed. So I'm a, let me say, will I say I'm ashamed? I'm not really ashamed particularly, but I think basically because I didn't grow up, I can't speak my local dialect. And most times when I speak English, I'm not an English man. So I didn't grow up more like, so that's sort of more like um, kind of um, mm, more like you don't feel comfortable in that space that the language where you are better, more like you are better from, you can't speak it. So I think that was what I was trying to portray there, history and language, particularly side by side, because I believe that the past influenced the present and the present influenced the future, basically. So since I have knowledge of what happened in the past, that's why I do a lot of digging, a lot of research in my poems, because I want to go back. What exactly happened? I don't just want um, oral, um recitations i want to see where it all started from and what happened in the niger delta would couple with the civil war i you know you can't stomach it when you start reading histories back in what happened in the civil war and most of what happened in niger delta you feel sort of more like you tend to puke because you see how can people have such kind of heart to perpetrate such kind of violence and that was what I was trying to explore in the point. I think I was still trying to explore migration in between because sort of more like I was trying to go back and see, can I go back home? And I was comparing it with exactly, so I was trying to draw a world view about migration, history, and language in that point. Yeah, thank you. That That's beautiful. History, migration, language, all right there. Um, I only have one more question for both of you. Um, thank you so much already for, for all of your honesty tonight and, and for sharing your wonderful words. Um, but my final question is hopefully an easy one. Uh, just if there is, what is something that um, you have been obsessed with recently or something that have you, you're extremely looking forward to or something you're very happy about? <laughs> for me particularly, I think I'm spoiling for good news. You know. I said, this should be June. I think we're in January. And on the first January, I think the last quarter of the year, December till January, I've been making some applications here and there for residencies. And man, I have to tell you that I've received tons of rejection mail. So right now, I'm looking forward to good news about because I believe that if I have, you know, initially what we were discussing before the whole life reading we're talking about how poetry funding was able to sort of more like sustain what we are doing right now now without the funding there will not be pajamas or poetry reading particularly so i down in this part of the divide we don't have such kind of this um how like that well i say sustainability or um sort of help assistance you don't have the platform exactly so Basically, right now, what I'm looking forward is collaborations, partnership, and I love the fact that Cindy has friends around where she can go to the studios and hopefully branch out of poetry and do some other things. But still, it's still a blend between writing, text, a visual act, and the all multimedia and stuff. So what I'm looking forward to right now is hopefully good news with regards to my residencies. I've applied to some, and hopefully, and collaborations in that. And big on collaborations, I believe definitely we can influence each other. 
you understand me? It, uh, it's a synergy. We can create a synergy between my work and your work and see how, what it looks like to combine different worldviews. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, most of those visual artists that I mentioned are people I met at residencies. So that is a space that I think is very specific in the arts and it's hard to explain to people. You're like, and everything's free and then they pay me and people are like, you're describing a hotel experience, a resort experience. Um, so I do think that residencies can be really special and I and I love the idea of, of collaborative ones where you can you know really live and share space together and that's very different than if, when, if you're in your day to day, you know, you're in a new environment, you're experiencing it together, you're meeting new people. Um, so that definitely is something to be excited about. Um, and I think actually at a residency earlier this year, I became a little um, like I wanted to go very deep into architecture because I made these architect friends and I just wanted to know everything. I had all these questions for them. <laughs> Um, about like my personal observations and like my, you know, assumptions. And I wanted to know about colonial architecture and what it, you know, a vernacular architecture and all these histories. And is this true? And is that true? So um, I've been reading some of their book recommendations and thinking a lot about um, what I don't notice, you know, what I take for granted in a building, like this is a house, this is a room, this is a you know, hotel and, and where that comes from and how that's built, you know, how the air flows and um, everything like that. And then I think also now that it's summer and I'm, I'm not teaching full time, I do sort of miss my students. And, and it's funny because I think when I'm teaching, I feel like my thoughts are overtaken with, oh, well, you know, Tristan and Alicia would love this, you know, article or, oh, you know, who would love, who writes like this? Like, you know, and so it's, it's something I'm always thinking about. And then some are supposed to be sort of a break, but now I sort of miss it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, students yeah. and architecture. That's lovely. You know, I, I think I, earlier when I was sort of more like, when I graduated from the university, I taught in a secondary school and I know the experiences, what it feels like sort of more like to be in that space where I usually have bond with students and hopefully rub minds together and see what great stuff you can make, so. Yeah, so, so special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so special. Um, thank you all so much. This has been such a pleasure. We are uh, running out of time now. Um, so thank you to both of you and to all of the people on the Facebook live stream for attending our 159th episode. Uh, we do hope to see you again next, no, not next week, almost actually a month from now. I've uh, A little slip up there <laughs> for Will Carpenter and Shireen K. Murayama, um, absolutely wonderful poets. Um, and the last thing I have to say is Taye and Cindy, is there anywhere our folks listening can find you online or support your work? Mm, yeah, definitely. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. I think I'm on Twitter as Ojo underscore poems. Maybe, I don't know if I can type it. Maybe I can type it. I can put it in the chat. Okay, okay, you can put it in the chat. You can find me more like, on Twitter, on Instagram, it's still the same thing, Ojo underscore poems. And hopefully if there's anyone that would love more like, um, uh, as I said before about collaborations, I'm open to whatsoever anybody has in mind. Definitely I want to collaborate with folks abroad, within the local circle where I am and hopefully build communities. So that's all for now. Um, I don't have social media, but I have um, my first book is coming out in early 2024. Um, um, it's called Ward. And um, thank you so much to you for hosting and for Poets and Pajamas for having the series. And it's great to meet you both. Yes, great to meet y'all. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time. Yep. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you.